Two months ago, General Odierno made the following statement in regards to our recent experience in Iraq. He said, we had no idea or clue of the societal devastation that had gone on inside of Iraq and what would push back on us. We didn't even think about it until we got in there. So we can't allow that to happen again. So how is it that the case that we failed to understand the impact that our actions would have on the environment? Good morning and thank you for joining us today. My, my name is Major Josh Galanik. And here in the Local Dynamics of War Scholars Program, we use scholarship in the social sciences to better inform our understanding of the operational environment and to identify the competing causal claims that describe the complex processes of war and peace. We seek to develop creative interventions amid this complexity in order to move the environment towards a more desirable state of affairs. Now, our senior military leaders have reflected on our recent experiences, and they've come to a conclusion. They don't believe that we are thoroughly enough educated in the social, political, economic, cultural, moral, and human dimensions of the operational environment. So in order to resolve this, they've expressed a need to develop a new leader development experience that prepares military officers to better understand these areas. Now the importance of causality in military operations is demonstrated by another recent statement by General Odierno, where he says, as we train our leaders, about, it's about training them to figure out why is this happening? Then what's the right tool to fix it? And we have to understand it much earlier in our careers now. General Dempsey has recently provided us some guidance on ways to think about how to intervene in the operational environment, saying, and then the other interesting thing about strategy to me is whether it's best to define an end state and then deliberately plot a series of actions to achieve that end state, or whether the world in which you live today actually is one where, kind of like the Heisenberg principle in physics, where you should touch it and see what happens. So this idea and this concept of experimental action is one in which we make well-informed decisions about where and how to intervene understanding that the complexity of the environment often precludes us from fully understanding beforehand what the outcomes will be. So those interventions that are successful, we continue and we reinforce them. And those interventions that are not successful and that, that have undesired consequences, we pull back from those. Now today, we're going to use the conflict in the Democratic Republic of the Congo is an example of how to apply the tools and the concepts that we learn about here in the Local Dynamics of War Scholars course. So our ultimate aim today is to show you how our approach can be of benefit to military professionals. So we'll start with Major John Brooker, who is going to begin to describe for us the environment and the story of the Congo. We're using the book, The Trouble with the Congo, by Severino Tessere to illustrate how we can use cutting-edge scholarship in addition to the tools we already have to better understand the operating environment. Just like Major Glonick said, you saw the quotes from General Odierno and General Dempsey. We have to un underline those. The foundation of those is understanding the operational environment and understanding how things work earlier in our career than we ever have. In this book, The Trouble with the Congo, Otisser asks this principal question. Why has the largest peacekeeping mission in the world failed to build a sustainable peace? I think you'll see as we go through the presentation, you can draw a number of parallels with our intervention in Afghanistan, our intervention in Iraq, and our interventions in all the, over the world throughout the last 20 years with what Otisser has seen in the Congo. Why has there not been a sustainable peace despite all of our efforts? Now a quick timeline, the dominant timeline, how the international community sees the conflict in the Congo will help illustrate these points. In October of 1996, the international community declared that war began in the Congo. It's the first Congolese war. And it really blended with the second Congolese war. And for approximately six years there was fighting. Throughout that six years, though, there were a number of agreements between the militias within the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which we, in this presentation, will shorten as either DRC or the Congo, what used to be called Zaire up until uh, 2002. There were a bunch of uh, 
agreements, a number of agreements. The final ones were finalized in December of 2002. The first UN peacekeeping forces and UN observers arrived in 2000. The first uh, batch of peacekeepers and observers, there were 224 of them in 2000. By 2001, there were about 2,000 of them. And they were there to enforce the peace and to watch over the situation. Pursuant to these agreements, Joseph Kabila was installed as the president in June of 2003. When the peace agreements were signed in 2002, that signified the end of the war and the beginning of the post-conflict period. To this conflict, it was kind of like what we saw President Bush on that aircraft carrier with Iraq, the banner in the back, mission accomplished. We are transitioning from the kinetic war phase to a post-conflict peace phase. There were elections, of course we drove to elections and we were part of this peacekeeping, not the military force but the efforts in terms of funding it and advice and diplomacy. And the peacekeepers pushed towards elections, which were completed in 2006. But here's the problem. Despite all those interventions and all those efforts and using these national level tools, <laughs> violence has continued. Since 2007, over 2 million people have been displaced in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Congo. Tens of thousands of deaths. 80% of people say they're in the same or worse position in their life in the eastern part of the Congo than when the elections happened in 2006. So the question is, why? Why has that happened? What are the causes of that? If we're going to intervene more effectively and understand the operational environment, we have to understand why. So how do we look at it? We are looking at it in a, with using a number of tools. But for today, we're looking at how Severino Tessera looked at it. And through her scholarship, what has she found? And she has posited that there's a difference between a top-down analysis, a national-level analysis, where we conduct elections, where we talk to political players on the national level. And we do that all the time, and we're pretty good at that. And Major Crawford is going to discuss how a top-down analysis works and give you a framework for that. And, but she says we often miss what's called a bottom-up analysis, the micro level. We have to understand it at the grassroots level, and Major Nopti will talk about that. And they will go into those in depth, and then I will come back and show Altisera's recommendations before we move on with the rest of the presentation. So I'll be followed by Major Crawford, who will talk about the top-down analysis. I'm going to discuss the top-down analysis. And while I go through this, I would ask that you remain empathetic to the causal stories that I'm telling. And the reason I would ask this is that we as military professionals are very familiar, we're very comfortable with top-down analysis. So it, what I talk about here just seems very, very comfortable to us. In 2002, when the uh, December, when the peace accords were signed, uh, this, tra this led to a transition or transitional government was uh, in place. The international community viewed this time period through three cultural lenses that I'll discuss. These cultural lenses, the first one is the macro cleavages. This is sort of the master narrative of what the trouble with the Congo is. The, mass, the macro cleavages result from two million refugees coming from Rwanda into the Congo and causing ethnic strife, driving uh, violence. Uh, the master cleavages are elite actors warlords across the country with these proxy armies driving violence. The master cleavages are regional conflicts driven from competition over the natural resources. You can see on the right side of the screen here, Eastern Congo is full of natural resources. You have tin and copper mines. You have diamond, gold. You have precious metals that are required for the creation of advanced technologies. All of this area has driven violence because there's a competition for these resources. There's a smuggling in and out of the country of these resources. These macro level cleavages are really what drive the violence in the Congo. The second cultural lens that I'll discuss is the post-conflict label. In December 2002, when the peace accords happened, there was a transition. And that transition was we are now in post-conflict Congo. The post-conflict Congo was a signal to the international community that we were no longer focusing on security issues within the Congo, but instead we're focusing on political and economic uh, situations. 
So, so the international community has shifted their focus when this label was occurred. You can understand that post-conflict. We're going to focus on political. We're going to focus on economic. We're no longer so much concerned with security. The second thing about the post-conflict label is that it provides legitimate actors for the international community. Before, when you had this conflict situation in the Congo, you really couldn't pick and choose, or you had a difficult time picking and choosing who was a legitimate and illegitimate actors. However, when the post-conflict label occurred, there were legitimate actors. It's the transitional government. That's the proxies that we're going to funnel our goods and our funds through to help improve the situation in the Congo. The third uh, cultural lens uh, about the Congo is that it's inherently violent. And quite frankly, some societies are more violent than others. Uh, and with the Congo, what we have in a, a very simplified version of uh, Thomas Hobbes is that uh, the absence of government authority has resulted in anarchy across the Congo. You have no government authority, there's a vacuum, and in its place has rise anarchy. And what we have is barbarism, we have rape, we have murder, and these things have become cultural norms across the Congo. It is just a violent location, and that violence is so prevalent that it's permeated uh, you know, international uh, dialect when we're talking about the Congo. It's permeated print media. It's permeated news media, documentaries, uh, most famously, The Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. It's about the savagery of the Congo. Uh, so, so it's a very you know, easy thing to say, hey, the Congo is very violent. They've been killing each other for hundreds of years. We understand that. So these three cultural lenses, this very top-down view of what's wrong with the Congo. And to, to solve a top-down problems, we need to come up with top-down solutions. The first top-down solution is driven really from this kit bag. The international community is familiar with top-down problems. They're so familiar that we have sort of this go-to tool that we use when we have problems like this, and that's elections. We like to run elections to solve problems. And what do elections do? They provide us with a legitimate government. Elections are the only way to, to come up with a legitimate government. Two, elections provide us with those legitimate actors. The international community can reach out to that legitimate government and say, here are goods and funds to help you improve your nation. The third thing, and as it builds here, the theory from the Hobbesian gap is elections are going to provide government, as you see building across this slide right now. This Hobbesian government is going to flow out to the Congo, and we're going to fill that vacuum where no legitimate authority existed and we're going to provide it with elections, with the legitimate government. The second solution that I'm going to talk about is the alleviation of national tensions. And the alleviation of national tensions I mentioned previously, you have these five distinct areas within the Congo where warlords control. You have five, essentially, many countries. And so to alleviate those tensions, we bring those players to the table. That's a part of the elections. You give these people a political voice. You make these five warlords vice presidents. You give them a role in the government. You legitimize them. And we, we unify the country by bringing these elite actors to the table. The second thing we do to alleviate national tensions is that we take these proxy armies that the warlords control and we create a unified national army. You have skilled, experienced fighters. It's a ready-made army. We create one unified army out of this. And the third thing is the the alleviation of the ethnic tensions that happen across the country. You had the two million Rwandan refugees. You have issues with refugees dating back hundreds of years. You also have the previous regime had institutionalized racism. We, we removed these things from the process and we alleviated them. The third, the third top-down solution is the alleviation of regional tensions. There are many things that have regional tensions with the neighbors of uh, the Congo, um, but one of the most important things is those natural resources that I previously discussed. So to alleviate the tensions, you need to go in and secure and create viable economic trade with the partners across the lakes region around the Congo. That viable economic trade will in turn decrease violence because we're eliminating the need or this criminal element funneling goods in and out of the country. So what
what I talked about was a very top-down analysis, and that was there are top-down problems that we see through three cultural lenses. These top-down <laughs> problems require top-down solutions to solve what the trouble with the Congo is. I'll be followed by Major Napti, who's going to provide a different theory on what the problem is. Good morning, Major Napti. Major Crawford just provided us the top-down approach to analysis. Now I'm going to fill this with the bottom-up analysis and local-level analysis. And when I'm specifically talking about the local level, I am looking at the individual, the community, the district, the village, and the municipality levels. Let me first begin with Seraphine. Seraphine is a Congolese woman born in Manyama. To a Congolese tribe, not of Hutu or Tutsi descent. Her father was a successful agricultural businessman who traveled the country and had the opportunity to travel to the neighboring countries of Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi. Her family owns land in Manyama. Thus, her mother herself and her brother farmed those lands. In the mid-1990s, her family's business suffered a devastating fire, followed by looting, suspected to be conducted by a local rival tribe. This led the father and her brother to take arms and retaliate. In the early 2000s, her father and brother were killed. Soon thereafter, early 2000s to mid 2000s, both Seraphine and her mother suffered a horrific sexual assault, leaving Seraphine disabled. Both were not found until the next morning, where they were taken to a clinic in Manyama. There, they were approached or interviewed by a foreign journalist who asked them first about their situation to provide that, that story, and second, about the upcoming elections and their part in it. Both were unaware that they had the right to vote. Both were unaware what the elections were for or that it was for national legislative elections. And both had thought that the elections were for the election of a local tribal chief. Now, Seraphine's story can be told all throughout the Congo. Stories of motivations, of power and control, the ownership of land and resources, the belonging to a, the belonging to a community, to a certain ethnicity, to a tribe, and stories of retaliation. For instance, when a local tribal member has political power or local authority, it guarantees him access to land. It guarantees that he can provide that land to a family, and that family is then provided community membership. These interactions, these local dynamics, can create or exacerbate tensions and antagonisms. And it can occur over a long period of time. Let's take, for instance, and quickly go over land disputes. In the 1930s, the Belgian government immigrated tens of thousands of Rwandans to the plantations of Kasai and to the mines of Katanga. Contested land between tribes further exacerbated once these immigrants wanted pieces of land. During the revolution of Rwanda, North Kivu and South Kivu areas, already densely, densely populated, was further populated with refugees who fled systematic massacres. Again, once again, these refugees, being there for a certain time, wanted access and control of land. And then to the 1960s, when the governments of Congo supported the, immigrations, the immigration of thousands of Rwandans to the area for pastoralism. Now this destroyed thousands of acres of cropland. Now we're looking at farmers and livestock herders contending with each other. With the top-down approach, what we're missing are what we're missing, those intricacies, those interactions between tribal leaders, those interactions between families, 
over contested land, over contested natural resources, over the manipulation of local militia, over the exploitation of natural resources. And we're, we're missing that. We're, we're missing the interactions. Through the bottom-up analysis and through a bottom-up approach, in conjunction with the top-down, we get to those interactions and we learn of the local dynamics. I'll be followed by Major Brooker to cover the implications. So how does this impact us as unified action partners? We saw the quotes from General Odierno and General Dempsey, and you really can see how it matches up with what Severine Otisera says. She says, in the Congo, we need to reevaluate the entire approach to post-conflict intervention. That marries up very nicely with what our senior leadership says what we need to do, those of us in uniform. So let's look at that. Let's look at, once again, summarize what she thinks is the problem, what she thinks is the solution, and how it fits in with what we do as unified action partners. Top-down analysis. What Otisera says is it's not enough. She says with the international peacekeeping community, they look at peace and war as a dichotomy. You have peace. So let's look at the Congo. You have peace up until 1996. In 1996, you have war until December 2002. And then you have peace, which is post-conflict. And how you categorize that conflict is going to drive the actions you do. And that's what Major Crawford was talking about. That is, if you're post-conflict, you have a legitimate government. You're going to no longer negotiate with certain warlords or tribal leaders or even the vice presidents, maybe. You're going to deal with the president, and it's going to impact your behavior on the ground. It's because of this categorization. Now, an interesting parallel, it's just a, it's somewhat of a parallel, it's not precisely the same, is if you look at JP 5-0, we categorize the phases of a conflict as well. And you can overlay that with what the international peacekeeping community does on top of that and see our phases two and three are more akin to the war phase. And our phases zero, one, four, and five are more akin to the peace phase. Now I will say, there is nothing in JP 5-0 that says you cannot use dominate activities, to use the doctrinal term, in phases four and five. You absolutely can. But it's critical for us to just study this and look. The, how we categorize a conflict, does that in any way influence what we do, or do we put constraints upon ourselves that we shouldn't do? It's just something to analyze. We should also analyze how we apply power, and from the top-down approach. Ota Serra says we always apply power top-down, and we apply solutions from a top-down way. This is a picture of the presidential palace in uh, Kinshasa, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It, beautiful grounds, a beautiful building, but that is where we're applying power, that is where we negotiate, that is where we focus a lot of our efforts. And does that translate down to the granular level, the Seraphine's problem? And that's something to look into, and Ota Serra says no. If we do a parallel to our situation in Afghanistan, you see on the news today, everyone's focused on the elections that are going to happen tomorrow. That's the focus in the country, that's the focus internationally, because we see how we apply power in Afghanistan. We've applied power in a lot of times to try and get that government out into the villages, just like the build slide, the theory of elections. It's going to increase the relevance of the government in the local area, and that's a valid strategy. It's just it's not complete. You have to look not only at the top-down approach, because the top-down approach absolutely can contribute to the violence. But what's incomplete is we don't take enough of a bottom-up approach as well. We have to understand Seraphine's story. We have to understand how the land disputes at the local level between families, between tribes, can boil up to violence and interact with the top-down approach, <coughs> excuse me, top-down approach and top-down causes to get a better picture of why the violence occurs. And when we do that, and if we understand that peace and war are a continuum. Peace and war are not a dichotomy. Where the violence is can shift given the pressure we apply. And if we understand the whole picture and how the bottom-up approach impacts where the violence goes, whether it's reduced and goes to peace, or whether it's increased and we go to what we would consider a war, if we understand how all of this interplays, we can apply force more effectively than we do otherwise. Taking this approach is in no way inconsistent with the tools we already have here within CGSC, within our professional military education, and within the military. 
If you look at our design methodology, Army design methodology or design and joint doctrine, we first understand the problem. If we look at Otisir, if we understand at the local level, the micro level, we'll better understand the whole picture to visualize what doctrine says is an end state. Or, as General Dempsey said, maybe we shouldn't do an end state. Maybe we should just experimentally intervene, but visualize what we think might happen when we intervene in a certain way. And then we describe. We not only describe to our military leaders and those to the left, right, top, down, but we can describe to unified action partners how they might intervene in a situation if we're able to understand the whole situation and work with our Department of State fellow interveners and USAID and all the rest to come up with a comprehensive solution so we don't have 15 years of war. Now to do this, we do the same types of things, system analysis, operational approach. We just here in LDW use some other resources that we've learned throughout the year to implement these, this same type of thinking. I'll be followed by Major Dedman, who's going to be talking about a systems approach. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do here in the next section is to try to discuss uh, the application of some of the tools that we have learned in the uh, Local Dynamics of War seminar uh, to understand the complexities of the environment, to understand the causal logics between these systems that operate in the environment, to understand planner biases as you're planning for these operations so that you can determine a more effective way to intervene in the environment. So um, I'm gonna start talking to you about the systems perspective approach which helps you understand key actors, key functions, and their roles and functions within that system. So starting off with the 2006 elections, I will talk about local authority, just walk you through in space and time how this system of local authority was shaped by interventions by other actors in the environment. So starting during uh, colonization times, local authority at this time was granted to tribal leaders based on their ethnicity. So as a tribal leader, I was able to disperse, own, dictate who and where land uh, was given to a specific uh, particular group. Then we have the Mobuto years. This uh, law of general property was established nationalizing land. So as a tribal leader, I no longer have the power to disperse land, to protect it, to divide it, however I see fit. So as a result, you see this, this uh, local authority system uh, shifting, diverging into a different path, creating different alliances that not necessarily um, tie to the national government at that point in time. You see local tribal militias being established in different groups uh, for purposes of self-defense and to ensure that they maintain profit for those mines, for those uh, precious resources that we were talking about. So then you see the, the Rwandan Civil War. During this time, we see a mass influx uh, of migration. 50,000 uh, Hutu militia come across the border in this area of Kibu. We see an increase in ethnic tensions, land disputes, leading to Uganda uh, getting involved, leading to the assassination of the current president in 2001, and Joseph Kabila being instituted as the follow-on president. So that you can see the complexity of the environment and how the systems act independently, but yet they're affected by other systems as, as they collide in the environment in space and time. So staying with the uh, local authority system, I'm going to talk to you, show you two different examples on how the macro level cleavages that Major Crawford was talking about, the top level approach that we discussed during the 2006 elections, that was going to fix those micro level problems. So if you're looking at local authority, how it's decided, all the different systems, all the different relationships and functions that intervene with local uh, law authority, you see all the different systems that are related to 
at that local level to be able to retain that local authority, to be able to support that national level authority, political authority that we're trying to institute. So you see here the different relationships and how it ties to those macro level cleavages and to each other. So the intent here with this slide is so that you can see any action that you take in the operational environment, it's gonna have second and third order effects with the other citizens. Now, this example shows you the top-down uh, top level approach, as Major Crawford explained it. And you see the different groups, how they're very cleanly delineated. But when you do that, you miss the 10 other groups that operate within that same environment. So therefore, it's, it's important to take a look at through assistance analysis, both the macro and the micro level so that you can understand how any intervention with any of the systems is gonna have a direct effect with those micro level cleavages. Okay, now that we have explained the systems in action in the operating environment, uh, I'm gonna transition it to Roger Webb to discuss the council logics that makes these systems behave uh, in a certain way. So, what does all this uh, open system analysis mean? What I'm going to talk about is how the elements and factors that exist within the environment interact and result specifically in violence. Now, throughout our presentation, we've touched on divisions between Hutus and Tutsis, ethnic groups within the country of the DRC. We've talked about uh, rifts between indigenous and non-indigenous uh, populations within the country. And we've also talked on a macro level about some of the regional issues uh, that uh, the DRC has with some of its neighbors, such as Rwanda. Now, all of these represent cleavages, both master cleavages and local cleavages, along which violence can occur. Now, the weak nature of the DRC government and its inability to control the, entire, uh, the entirety of its territory uh, um, gives an opportunity, creates a, uh, uh, an environment by which violence can occur according to these cleavages. Yet, that is not enough to explain why violence occurs in the Congo. Now, into this unstable environment, we had the shock of the Rwandan genocide in 1994 that resulted in uh, about two million refugees who were both victims and perpetrators of the genocide in 94 uh, that came into the Congo. Uh, and that sparked a lot of, of tension along these cleavages that resulted in a perpetual state of war in the Congo, starting with the first Congo war and continuing all the way to today. Now, when we look at causality, we have four basic categories of causal logics, starting with structural causal logics, which relate to the physical environment, the tangible things within the environment. Uh, we have the institutional causal logics, which relate to how people and communities organize themselves. Um, we have ideational causal logics, which um, touches on the ideas and beliefs that exist within people and within communities. And finally, we have psychological causal logics, which um, tries to address the way people are hardwired to do things that other people might consider irrational. Now, what's important to note about the Congo is that all four of these causal logics are in play at any one point in time within the, within the, the country. So you can't take uh, a purely uh, ideational institutional approach to understanding it and there is no one uh, single cause uh, of the conflict. So, for example, we talked about the weak government of the DRC, which is uh, institutional on one level, but then exasperated by the size of the country and the distance between the capital of Kinshasa and the conflict areas in the eastern Congo, which affects, um, uh, exasperates the, the government's ability to project power in those regions. Um, so. Throughout our presentation, uh, we've focused only on a, a handful of these. We've talked about the uh, weak central government that has um, uh, 
given basic sovereignty, uh, unintended sovereignty, to uh, non-state actors like militias and warlords. It's also created a space opportunity for uh, belligerent regional powers to come in and, and have influence. And then on the ideational level, we've talked about um, identities developing uh, within the Eastern Congo based on racism. And we've also talked about um, the, the belief that land or possession of land is equated to survival. Now, obviously the land issue has structural and institutional elements, but if it was only a structural institutional element, uh, uh, causal logic, then there would be more prescriptive steps that could be taken to solve that. However, what we're talking about here in the ideational causal logic is the belief that's been um, formulated over time uh, that's related, that exasperates the ability to solve the land issue. So both of these, identity and land equals survival, are, uh, occur on the local level. And then on the, on the macro level, we have international organizations that come in and they have their own ideations and their own uh, belief systems. One of those belief systems is that uh, uh, the Congo is inherently brutal and violent. Now, this belief feeds into an organizational culture that, that limits the ability of the very institutions that we call upon to, uh, to cease the violence in the Congo to actually accomplish their mission. And then lastly, um, there is a psychological effect that happens both on the macro and on the micro level of anchoring, where the conflict has been going on for so long and the, the number of dead, millions that have died previously, has become an anchor where we are almost conditioned to see something that is irrational as rational. So what's another 500,000 dead when 3 million have already died? And that would be a psychological causal logic. So to put this back into the framework of understanding that we're using to uh, talk about conflict in the Congo, we see that the causal logics here can help bridge the gap between the macro and the local level. And we also see how the master and local cleavages uh, are present on the entire continuum from peace heading towards war. So now to uh, dive further into how these causal logics play out um, with, within the Congo, uh, I'll turn it over to Major uh, Stoney Portis, who will speak specifically about the, uh, the case of the 2006 elections. Thank you. So as of right now, we've seen this focus on elections, rather than perhaps the focus of violence. This quote by a Western diplomat, as reported by Otis Air in her book, really encapsulates this idea that violence is a very nebulous thing, a very nebulous problem to solve, hard to get your hands around, whereas elections are actually somewhat mechanical. And because of that, what we see among international peace builders, such as the UN and Monarch in Congo, is a propensity towards elections. In fact, what she calls an election fetish. Why is that? Well, one thing that we have in the local dynamics of war is the institutional analysis and development framework. This was developed by a Nobel laureate, and we use it basically to inform us how institutions behave and why they behave in terms of the physical conditions around them, as well as the attributes within the culture of the organization. We're going to use this model of institutional analysis to explain why we have this focus on elections, the opportunity cost of this focus on elections, and how these elections are actually, in the case of 2006, a catalyst for conflict. The liberal peace thesis, at its core, says that democracies don't go to war with one another, and they maintain internal domestic peace because they have processes and systems that help reduce antagonisms. So when a Western power rebuilds a country, they typically subscribe to the democratic reconstruction model, which states, we're going to build this country with imperatives towards democratization, legitimization, and war termination. In the case where you have regional conflict, typically, 
you would work to form international courts, as was the case leading up to the 2006 elections in the Congo, where we created accords to establish a regional peace among Rwanda, Burundi, and the Congo. From there, we helped develop the security sector that's building the army to local polices. We have political systems, whether we're talking about the legislature, as well as rebuilding the constitution, reforming it. Of course, we hold elections because that is central to the democratic reconstruction model in that elections are the only legitimate way to create government authorities. This is for a couple of reasons, two of which are that elections broaden and deepen political participation among the people, but also elections are a form of democratic accountability of the governments to the people. From there, we reform the economic environment and we're continuing to push along from war to a state of peace as we rebuild. The problem here is that this takes a long time to do. There are preconditions like freedom of association or freedom of the judiciary, political parties, or civil society that are necessary requisites for elections. In 2006, this micro level or macro level approach, top down approach, missed a key aspect of violence by focusing on elections. What was really going on down here? Well, throughout the entire time, we've established that there's internal conflict ongoing. And what we saw specifically was a rush to elections. Elections became a shortcut cut to avoid a very difficult and complex process of rebuilding a civil society. Evidence substantiates that elections immediately following a civil war actually increase tensions. The reason is simple. Instead of reconciling, reconciling differences between oppositions, now opposition leaders have to mobilize support and differentiate themselves from their opponent. Typically what this does, as was the case when Kabila was elected, is it completely overlooks those preconditions. And now, candidates from Rwanda descent couldn't even campaign across the country safely. Voters were intimidated by militias that were devoted to Kabila. His main opponent, Bimba, was actually threatened and assaulted multiple times. And then, once elected, he created policies that continued to exacerbate those conflicts. He did this as a survival mechanism of sorts. Those with which he was mostly threatened by, he was able to fragment and create more opposition. So what you had was a top-down approach that pushed us a certain way across peace, a certain distance across towards the war-peace continuum. And then you had bottom-up conflict that really added a roadblock along that continuum. And with internal conflict continuing, what you created was a mode of constant crisis in the Congo from 2006 onward where we maintain internal conflict. To further explain different approaches to understanding specific causal stories within this paradigm, I'll be followed by my colleague, Major Pager. Okay, so in LDW, we study um, interpretive method, methods and their application in better order to understand the complexity of the operating environment. Because words, stories, actions, events that go on are interpreted and misinterpreted by different actors in different ways, um, our ability to understand the meanings that are placed upon those things and the way that those are being inter interpreted by the actors in our environment allows us to better build an experimental um, action um, for our operational approach. A basic example of that a very basic, simple example of that is simply the elections and what that signaled to, to the um, international actors at the top and to the local actors at the bottom. So as an international actor, if I'm a UN peacekeeper who's come, or UN representative that is coming to work in the Congo, simply I, I will view elections as a way to practice democracy and through the practice of democracy I can create peace and through the creation of peace I can then um, I can bring economic opportunities to all of those in the rural areas because they're no longer fighting over land it means to me that I can bring legit I can legitimize the government and um, I can legitimize the government that I'm trying to bring to control the rest of the country in. 
It also is the story that I tell myself that motivates me to spend all my time, my resources, and my energy on those elections. And it, it, it's the same thing that justifies why I feel like I don't need to spend any of my resources on solving any local problems, because elections are going to do all of that for me. And this story um, that I tell myself is the same story that I share to my, part, my peace building partners to the left of me and to the right of me, and it's the same story that I'm going to tell to the international community. The problem with that is the top-down approach misses what is the reality of what's going on at the bottom. As a, lo as a local power broker, I'm worried and I'm scared about what these elections are going to, I mean, I'm worried that the, the sway and the balance of the power is going to, it's not going to favor my side. And when that happens, I'm going to lose the access to my land, I'm going to lose the military and political positions that I now hold, I'm going to lose the access to the mines that I control in my area. And when that happens, I have no other economic opportunities to create wealth for myself. I have no other land to feed my family off of. And I don't have the means to pay for the weapons, the bullets, or the security forces that I need to protect all of my people who are now going to be facing retribution or revenge from the, the new power that comes into, into place once these elections are over. So I'm extremely concerned. So elections, what that signals to me and the way that I'm interpreting it is that I need to prepare to fight. Then there's another group of local actors who it either has little meaning or causes greater confusion. As Major Nepti talked about before, as a woman, I might think that I'm not even allowed to participate, and so I don't. Or I'm participating, and I think I'm voting for my local chief or the governor's aide, and in reality, I have no idea who I'm voting for in these elections or, or what they even are. And that is in stark contrast to what the top-down um, what the top-down approach thinks they're going to achieve by creating this democratic participation throughout the country. Then there's another group of people who the, the, um, the elections will have absolutely little meaning to them at all because they don't even know that they're going to occur and they don't even know what, when they're over. All they know and experience is that, they've, that they are now going through an increased level of violence and they have no idea why. So, as a, as a practitioner, the importance, sorry, the importance of being able to, to bridge the top-down approach and what I hope to achieve through the, and the reality of what's going on at the bottom up is that I am able to um, understand the perspectives of the different actors in the operating environment and be receptive to the motivations and, and the meaning that they're going to apply to all the words, the narratives, the actions, and the events that are going on, and then thus, once I'm able to do that, I'm able to build a better approach and a better solution to the problems that are going on there. And next, I'm going to be followed by Major Davis, who's going to talk about how these, all these different analytical approaches that we just discussed um, complicates our understanding of the operational approach. So the question is, what are, the, what are the implications for a potential operational approach? So consider then the traditional level of war, or levels of war, the strategic, the operational, and the tactical, and the effect of the contemporary operating environment. The effect is a compression of what we think of as the traditional levels of war. They still exist, but they are compressed. They are closer conceptually in space and in time. Within the traditional levels of war and the contemporary environment, we have nodes and connections of complexity. Note that in the traditional levels, although there appears to be complexity, there is still some semblance of hierarchy within the levels. A hierarchy that disappears as the complexity grows and the connections grow and the space decreases in the compression. Complexity is increased and the nodes of that complexity are closer conceptually, more intertwined, and making them more susceptible to experimental interventions, for better or for worse. The proximity of the strategic, the operational, and the tactical effects in the contemporary operating environment increases the need to appropriately link the top-down and bottom-up approaches, experimental interventions, and their effects. Mission command becomes even more important in the contemporary operating environment as each level of command can have an outsized effect on the others 
and local commanders must be able to successfully link the top-down mechanizations with the bottom-up events through locally resonant actions and narratives. Finally, mission command informs the selection and execution of experimental interventions throughout the depth and complexity of the OE, which must be linked to changing conditions and the experimental interventions of others to create a more holistic, organic, and integrated outcome. So consider the operational approach to the Congo elections and violence in 2006. Any series of experimental interventions could have been undertaken within the complexity of the contemporary operating environment. Another number of top-down experimental interventions were undertaken. For example, national peace negotiations, the transitional national government, regional negotiations, and regional resource conferences. However, you also need a number of bottom-up experimental interventions to support the top-down interventions. Things such as truth and reconciliation committees, local development aid in support of peace building, or, or and, local resource and property rights initiatives that together can come together and achieve some of these mid-level effects, for example, allowing the formation of polities, something that is necessary for an effective election. Instead, we see another top-down approach, the elections themselves, that are disconnected from these bottom-up programs that were never initiated, or in some cases where they were initiated, never funded and, followed, and uh, successfully followed through. So what do we learn? We learn that this is a non-linear and systemic process, that not all nodes will be right for an experimental intervention at any given time. The nodes previously not right for experimental intervention may become right over time based on changes in the OE or the aggregate effects of previous experimental interventions. And then linking top-down and bottom-up intervention is essential to achieving sustainable effects. So what we see then is that the elements of the top-down approaches and the elements of the bottom-up approaches are our complexity within the contemporary operating environment. And just as we must link the tactical to the strategic, we must link the bottom up to the top down in the contemporary operating environment. I'll be followed by Major Mark. Good morning. What I'm going to be talking to you about today is the local dynamics and how those local dynamics enhance the Army's roles within the Joint Force. As seen here from the Army Strategic Planning Guidance of 2013, the Army's roles within the Joint Force are to prevent, shape, and win our nation's wars. We prevent conflict and destabilizing activities through our credibility as a modern, combat-ready, and globally deployable force. We shape the security conditions to be favorable to the United States and allied interests through our unique understanding and dominance of the land domain, as well as factors that influence human behavior. If prevention fails and shaping is insufficient, then the Army supports the Joint Forces' ability to win a campaign through its uh, capacity and expert capabilities and force readiness. To fulfill our responsibilities as military professionals, we need to become experts not just of our warrior tasks and drills, our doctrine and tactics, which are all important if we want to fulfill our roles, but we must become experts in our understanding of causality and complexity and incorporating those understandings into our planning processes and our intervention. To highlight this, I'd like to read a story that was told by General Dempsey of his time in Iraq in 2003 and 2004 when he was a, the first armored division commander. And I quote, As you know, the division's mission in the beginning of OIF was to go from Kuwait to Baghdad, movement to contact, hasty attack, a very understandable problem. Met T, mission, enemy, terrain, troops available, and time. I knew how to figure that out. It was me against them, and I knew who them were. And I knew where the ground was. I knew where I was, and could make this kind of mathematical. I could lay down this geometric formation and move it to Baghdad. Having arrived in Baghdad, the mission of the division was changed to establish a safe and secure environment. In a city of seven million with huge sectarian issues separated both physically and psychologically by a river, 
I was perplexed. He goes on to say that the commander's responsibility is to visualize, understand, decide, direct, and assess. We've got all kinds of tools for decide, direct, and assess, but we've got almost no tools, cognitive tools, to help leaders understand, to actually seek complexity before they seek simplicity. So what I'm saying is that we as military professionals have expertise and have developed an expert capability to accomplish our mission using these different uh, types of tasks and operations. So we are experts at planning processes, job and MDMP, operational art, at uh, decisive action. So in our offensive, defensive, stability and disk operations, we know dot mil PF, how to task organize, command and control, as well as how to do logistics. We become experts in that. However, as we saw at the very beginning of the presentation, as General Odiano pointed out, that still left us unprepared for what we encountered once we got into Iraq in 2003 and 2004. General Dempsey goes on to say that it is not enough to simply alter the balance of military power without careful consideration of what is necessary in order to preserve a functioning state. So even though we had that expertise, we were unprepared for what came next, and as a result, it took us a while to uh, try and figure the situation out and understand how to go forward from there. But General Dempsey says that before we go into these uh, operating environments, we need to anticipate and be prepared for the unintended consequences of our actions. So what type of military professional is needed? The Joint Force needs military professionals who cultivate an ethic of empathy towards the local people among whom and with whom the military professional must interact and intervene. So instead of relying on intuition, which is inherently biased, often conceiving groups of people as homogenous and often using counterproductive cultural labels and explanations, we need a military professional who searches for causality to understand the complexity before they seek to understand the simplicity, which I already pointed out in that slide. Next, we need a military professional that is willing to see things from numerous perspectives, considering the many imbricated and interacting systems, people, organizations, and ideologies, and then incorporating those perspectives into his and her or her decision-making processes. Next, we need military professionals who realize that solutions like end states can be misleading. So what we like to talk about in the military are end states, those objectives that we want to achieve. But sometimes that can be misleading because what we do in a country has lasting effects. Even though we may leave as an organization, we understand that what we do in a, in a country will go on for many, many years after we leave. So instead of thinking of them as end states, we like to think of them as desired state of affairs, realizing that our actions are going to continue beyond us. So similarly, we shouldn't look at problems as having solutions per se. Uh, as General Dempsey pointed out earlier in the brief, and was pointed out, that we ought to sometimes experiment with what's going on and see what happens. That's not just doing whatever and hope that it works out. This is an informed, deliberate uh, intervention that then we wait and see what happens on the other side of that intervention. So in other words, we shouldn't just come up with a solution, apply it to a problem, and then think that the problem is going to go away just because we applied a solution. So in other words, solutions can be misleading. And then finally, what we need is military professionals who become national security professionals, whose expertise extends from the tactical into the interconnected intellectual space of strategic theory, strategic thinking, and strategic formation. This professional is one who is capable of advising his, equally well his or her battalion through division commanders as well as his or her joint interagency, intergovernmental, and multinational partners on courses of action uh, that will hopefully work in the uh, operating environment. I'll be followed by Major Stephen Bolton. Major Morrow has just illuminated one of the key philosophical objectives 
here in the local dynamics of war seminar. That being, we want to determine if and how our approach suggests a necessary expansion to the soldier's professional obligation. I'd like to continue our discussion about local dynamics in the joint force by considering how our approach might enhance the military role within unified action. I'll begin by rephrasing our approach and the intent of the seminar contained within it, and then briefly examining each of its key components. Our practitioner applies a multidisciplinary approach to seek out the hidden cause and effect relationships in complex environments in order to develop and convey a deep situational understanding and a broader menu of engagement options for consideration by a community of interest. The use of a multidisciplinary approach achieves two immediate aims for us. First, it helps to mitigate many of the pitfalls which have become inherent within our organizational processes, uh, which also constrain our understanding of complex environments. These include a tendency to focus on macro level narratives uh, and cause, cause and effect relationships. It also includes our use of reductionism to simplify our explanation of those relationships. And the biases and the mental shortcuts, which have become inherent artifacts of our organization, as well as individual characteristics that we acquire through time and experience. The second immediate aim that it achieves is it improves on existing doctrinal practices. Now, our practitioner still applies all of the old familiar tools. Uh, when we develop and execute operations, actions, and activities, they are still guided and underwritten by policy, plans, doctrine. Uh, they are influenced by an individual's education, his training, and his experience. But what we advocate here in this seminar is a consultation of scholarly research and methodology in order to improve our realistic understanding of these environments. By doing so, by consulting numerous pieces of work about a given environment, uh, we are adding multiple voices to the discussion and we're providing sometimes contrarian information that uh, we would not have previously considered, but ultimately it is going to add a richness of detail that will then allow us to determine better points of intervention later on. Now this is all consistent with design methodology. It's consistent with MDMP, with JOLP, uh, as illuminated earlier by Major Moron. Uh, all of those call for us to begin our appreciation of an environment by organizing our facts and our assumptions. Well, these scholarly methods serve to fill in the gaps in our knowledge, and they correct our mistakes, uh, our mistaken facts and assumptions. There's also existing precedents for a uh, military bridge to academic uh, efforts at an institutional level, not so much at an operational level. Uh, if you consider the efforts of the Minerva Initiative, um, initiated by Secretary Gates, uh, or the Army's Research Institute for Behavioral and Social Sciences, if you consider the numerous uh, research partnerships that the Department of Defense has with academic institutions across the country, whether it's the Saltzman Institute for Peace at Columbia University uh, or, the, or the Strauss Center uh, at the University of Texas, there is a, a wealth of academic scholarly work being applied to military problems. But these methods aren't discussed or taught in most professional military education environments. And for that reason, they're not getting operationalized. They're not well appreciated by the planners who are actually developing the courses of action, the campaign plans uh, for the conduct of operations in every environment around the globe. We seek those undetected cause and effect uh, relationships that are poorly explained by the macro level narratives. Now, current methods, MDMP is focused, uh, it is concerned with cause and effect, but not to the same degree that we are looking for. Uh, we think that there's a tendency to miss some important detail because of the previously mentioned focus on macro level dynamics. General Dempsey, uh, speaking last fall, suggested that military action seldom, if ever, achieves its intended objectives. 
And I would suggest that one possible explanation for that is that our actions, our measures of performance, and our measures of, perfect, uh, measures of effectiveness are often connected to assumptions that we are addressing the right cause and effect relationships. But if we are rarely achieving our intended aims, then I think one of the places we ought to look at is that we are not addressing the right causal mechanisms. I think another possible explanation for that uh, observation of General Dempsey's is that we often misperceive our environments. Uh, rather than considering them to be complex, we think that they are only complicated. Now, the Congo case study that has been discussed today in this presentation uh, has provided numerous examples of the varied dynamics between different systems at macro level and micro level and meso level in between, and how these interact uh, over spatial, temporal, and hierarchical domains. Uh, systems evolve, sometimes they evolve autonomously. Micro level subsystems can evolve with a degree of autonomy undirect, uh, that, that is not directed by the actions of macro level efforts. However, the effects of that micro level evolution will at some point bubble up to have impact on our macro level objectives. Uh, and, and so when we determine that an environment is only complicated, instead of appreciating that complex interconnected dynamics, we tend to think of it as a problem to be solved by the suitable application of subject matter expertise. We put enough people working the problem in a room and eventually we're going to come up with a solution for the environment. The world is not merely complicated, at least nowhere that we need to go. Uh, and in a complex environment, cause and effect relationships are rarely self-evident. So a fix-it approach is far less appropriate, far less beneficial than an approach of experimental action. Now the sum of these first three components is situational understanding. I propose it here as an antidote to situational awareness. Essay does not have any precise definition within our doctrine, but it's got wide colloquial use, which means it's also open to wide interpretation. What I suggest is that situational understanding should imply an appreciation of not only the actors and the influences in a given operational environment, but also their past, their present, and their potential dynamic relationships and interconnectedness. And the goal of this understanding is to then enable the successful use of military capacity within unified action. We do this by developing a broad array of potential interventions that will have a variety of effects within the environment. Such a wealth of understanding expands our perspective on the range of potential interventions. And as suggested by General Dempsey's quote at the beginning of this presentation, the controlled use of experimental action ought to influence our environment uh, in potentially a better way than a war machine marching through a campaign plan inexorably towards an end state. The due diligence in, in providing a broader array of engagement options also provides the decision maker, the policy maker, with a spectrum of associated costs and risks and outcomes, which ought to lead to policy decisions and subsequent actions that are more aligned with the interests of national policy. Uh, I believe this is one of the objectives that General Dempsey had when he gave his testimony on five options for Syria last fall. That touches on the last point. Uh, you know, he, was, he was speaking to policymakers because that was the nature of his position, but my suggestion is that the benefits of our approach here belong to the unified action community at large, not just to the Army, not just to, to the Joint Force. Uh, if we see ourselves first and foremost as a unified action partner, then we are no longer operating just on the spectrum of military operations, the five phases of military operations that are neatly bracketed on either side by phase zero, which is representationally no greater in significance than any of the five phases in which the military uh, is the predominant force, the directing agency, as it were. Uh, instead, we ought to consider that as a unified action partner, we are acting on a spectrum of policy. 
And in this spectrum of policy, phase zero for us uh, is the predominant condition. And the five phases of military operations are the exception. They occur sporadically when required by policy, but by and large, some form of phase zero, whether it's peacetime uh, competition and cooperation, or pre-conflict environments or post-conflict environments, that is the norm, and that is actually the preferred uh, perception of our unified action partners. It resonates far better with the interagency community than, uh, than when we throw up the five phases of military operations. When we consider that we're actually operating on the spectrum of policy, then there's another component to that, that that's a key takeaway, which is all unified action partners may have a role at any point on that spectrum. No longer are we considering that there's a firm handoff of responsibility uh, where, where Department of State and diplomacy no longer have uh, a role in times of war and the military has minimal roles in times of peace. Instead, there's a blended effort between multiple agencies anywhere along the spectrum of policy. Uh, so the Department of State and diplomacy have a significant role to play in times of conflict. But likewise, the military, the joint force, and for that matter, the local dynamics method and approach are very well applied in a variety of peacetime environments. Again, seeking to find that best use of force. So ultimately, we find that the local dynamics approach does add to our professional obligations with, with an ethos of engagement in which we strive to provide our commanders our civilian and our partner nation counterparts at all levels with the means to minimize the untoward effects of military action on civilians. And at the same time to maximize the potential which our military capacity might bring to any given operational environment. I'll be followed by Major Strohmeyer. Ladies and gentlemen, in our briefing today, what you've heard overall is a us proffer a, a recommend a slight shift in the way that we as military practitioners view the operating environment. In a quote just last month, uh, Henry, Kissinger, Henry Kissinger in an op-ed piece for the Washington Post said that in his life he has seen four wars begin with great enthusiasm and public support, all of which we did not know how to end, and from three of which we withdrew unilaterally. The test of policy is how it ends, not how it begins. So as we've seen from the beginning to the end of this presentation, there is a, a, almost a mandate given by senior leaders to figure out why we are missing, what, what part of the story we're missing, where the gap is, and how we can fill that gap. What we would offer you today is a, the problem or the gap is a potentially exclusive top-down perspective that military planners, that non-governmental organizations typically use when they view a top-down approach to how to view a conflict, looking at top-down solutions. We talked about that specifically as it relates to the Congo. We talked about how when the UN went in and they looked at this conflict as a top-down problem based on different regional conflicts, based on major ethnic relation, uh, racial conflicts, that they missed some of the major micro-level cleavages that at the village level continued even after elections, and they never addressed those problems. And so then what we offered was a local dynamics perspective that doesn't exclude the top-down approach. In fact, it thinks it's very important but that now includes a bottom-up perspective as well. And that in that includes a great deal of, of scholarship to not just take this system and say, oh, it's extremely complex and leave it at that, but to take that complexity then and come up with ways to understand patterns of emergence of how, that, how things are caused within that complexity so that we can take action that's meaningful and that gets us towards a better state of affairs. We talked about things like structural, institutional, ideational, and psychological causal logics Ways, things that, bra that bridge the gap between the top down and the bottom up that help us to understand that complexity as we look at a system that has nodes going everywhere and links going everywhere. We talked about things such as that system's perspective that, go, that again bridges that gap between the top down and the bottom up. And then we talked about different interpretive method, methods that are informed by scholarship that help us to understand some of the things, some of the ways that we can see patterns in this to be able to make informed decisions. And over, overall, what we're offering is this local dynamics perspective that, just as Steve just said, is a highly eclectic approach combining multiple different means. It helps us to avoid stovepipe ways of seeing the world and stovepipe or maybe potentially biased perspectives on solutions. It, it uh, fundamentally helps us to understand those complex 
and complicated systems and then come up with patterns of causality so that we can recommend experimental interventions so we can get to a better state of affairs overall. Thank you for your time this morning. We're happy to field any of your questions at this time.